Good evening. We greet you this evening in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house as we come together to close out this day in the worship of our triune God. Before we begin to worship, let me remind you about some of the, the upcoming activities, the differences in this week. Uh, we do have uh, Men at the Gate 6.15 on Tuesday, but we will not have regular Wednesday night activities because, of course, we are having tomorrow the annual Labor Day picnic. That begins at 4 p.m. You've heard of all the things, that, all the different offerings that are there. Uh, one of the biggest offerings is something on the order of 400 people. This is a major event. Probably the city's parts of the city will shut down to accommodate um, our Labor Day picnic. But it's a wonderful time for fellowship with the body of Christ, uh, just to enjoy one another's company. So I hope you'll come out and, and be a part of that fellowship tomorrow uh, afternoon and evening. Uh, other things that you want to know about, because uh, uh, we won't have Wednesday activities, but uh, this coming Friday there is the choir kickoff. Uh, that's going to be at 6 p.m., on Friday evening and also 9 a.m. That, that comes back on uh, on Saturday morning, so plan for that. Um, also happening on Saturday morning is the coffee chat for the lady at the uh, first watch at the shops of Green Ridge. Uh, it's also at 9 a.m. Um, children's singing school will be kicking off next week. Um, there's a mommy and, and me play date coming up, the father and daughter camp out, all the things you can check on uh, in your bulletin, check the emails that come from the church office, and you can obviously get more details on those. Uh, and then uh, men's basketball, you are moved to Wednesday this week. You're, gonna, you're committed. You're going to have your, your time on the court. Uh, it just won't be Monday. It will be on, on Wednesday. And then some things for, for next Sunday to be aware of. Next Sunday we'll have promotion Sunday. So kids are, are, are moving up uh, in terms of elementary school students. Uh, and so, so those classes will be rotating. So, if, so that's based on that kind of September 1 birth date um, is the, the basis for that move. And then also when we come back for worship Sunday evening, we will be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So make sure that you prepare your hearts this week uh, and look forward to that time of communion. Even now as we prepare for worship, we're reminded that the practice of morning and evening worship is one that's taught in Scripture. It was the pattern that was carried out for the sacrifices in the temple, reminded of in Exodus 29. David gave it in the Psalms as a pattern for his prayer. And then and Peter continued that practice uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. We find out that this hit, was also his practice as well. And it was the practice of the early church that continued on. It continued on in monastic life, but the reformers, when they came on the scene, who were very, very keen to do away with wrong traditions, saw this as something that was biblical. They preserved it as part of the worship. And so we continue that pattern of worshiping this evening to continue to give the Lord his, his due as we meet together, but also to keep the whole Lord's Day holy. So recognize your privilege, even together tonight, to preserve the Sabbath before the Lord, to honor him, to be devoted to him, and also to hear his word. So in that light, compare, prepare yourself now for worship.
Here now as God calls us into his worship from Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's respond to that call to worship by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals. We'll turn to hymn number 219. We'll stand and sing together a psalm to God, a worship the King, based on Psalm 104, but that's hymn 219. Let's stand together and sing. Please remain standing and take your bulletins, and together we will confess our faith using the historic Apostles' Creed. We'll do so using the form that's printed there. Christian, I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary,
Please remain standing and take your Bibles and turn with me for our New Testament reading, the book of Revelation, chapter 8. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6, and you should also note there's a response printed to the reading of God's Word that you can be found in your bulletin. Hear now the word of the living God spoken to us from Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. When, he, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne." And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord speaking through Paul has reminded us that he who supplied seed to the sower and bread for food has assured us that he will also enlarge the harvest of your righteousness, making us rich in every way. Paul reminds the the church of Corinth that there is an obligation to give, but part of that obligation is with the trust of the Lord, that the Lord is a God who is gracious and merciful, who provides for his people. He goes on, he directs us in the purpose, he says, so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Again, that connected reminder that what you give when you give in worship is also an act of seeking the, the expanse of the kingdom. The money that you give is being used to support missionaries throughout the world who are proclaiming that same gospel which you enjoy. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless what we give tonight. Our Lord and our God, how we thank you that you have continued to be so good to us in so many ways that we are people who enjoy many feasts because of your kindness. And pray, Father, that we would recognize your generosity in particular, specific ways. And as we do so, that we would give back gladly, that others may enjoy what we enjoy with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you might bless them with an abundance as well. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Please join me now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, our great creator, our great redeemer, and our great sustainer, we come to you tonight recognizing that you are the Lord who sees and knows all. You are the king who hears and who answers prayer. You are a great God who hears his people when they come before him, and so we come confessing, indeed celebrating, that there is no God like you, O Lord. You are majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds. You do wonders. You, our Lord, are holy, holy, holy. You're holy in your essence and holy in your character and holy in your deeds. You are a God who is wholly other, transcendent and simple and unchanging and undiminished. And you are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should change your mind. You are light, and in you is no darkness at all, and faithfulness is all around you. Truth and unbroken promises come from you. Wisdom has its source in you. You are the one who formed light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates calamity. And all your acts are righteous and good and wise and glorious. And they testify to your glory, that you are a God who is mighty, who is wise, who is transcendent. There is nothing which you lack, and all power resides with you. Oh, Lord, you can do all your holy will. Holiness is all around you, and those who come near you must regard you as holy, and they must glorify you. And we come before you tonight confessing that we are not what we ought to be. We confess that our fear of you is a slight thing and that our desires for you are too little, that our time that we give to you is too brief, and that our glorying in you has so little weight. Lord, because of this, we lament our unholiness that we have not been holy as you are holy and as you have commanded us to be. We've not kept ourselves clean as you desire. We've given ourselves too much to pleasing ourselves and too little to the things of the Lord. And we confess, Lord, even tonight our worship is wanting and weak and unfocused. And our meditation on your word is shallow or missing. And our prayers which come before you are not bold approaches in Christ but are trivial And so, Lord, we come before you praying that you would forgive us for the sake of the Holy One of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who took on flesh to become our substitute. We ask that you would forgive us, that we might be able to come into your presence, and that we would have that place with you on the last day, being found in him, not having a righteousness of our own, but that which comes from the law, but that which is by faith in Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, whom you gave for us. And we thank you, Lord, that your word has promised to us that indeed you are a gracious God. And we thank you that in your wisdom and your mercy and your righteousness, you have not left us under the condemnation that we deserve. You've not abandoned us with your creation. You haven't given us as we deserve. But, Father, you instead have made your kind intention known to us in the person and work of your Son. We thank you that he did come into this world, taking on our flesh walking among us and living the life that we should have lived and dying the kind of death that we should have died. And because of that, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And with him, you have given us your spirit to make his home among us, to give us new life and to grant us spiritual power that we may no longer be slaves to sin and live for it, but to die to it, that we might live for righteousness. Because Christ, our Savior, has lived and suffered and died for us, and by his stripes we are healed. We thank you, Father, because of his work, because of the seal you placed upon us, we are able to come to you as sons whom you have adopted, given rights and privileges which are not natural to us, but graciously bestowed upon us. We're welcomed into your presence, and so we come before you and we plead with you that you would show us grace and mercy and give us help in our time of need. Lord, we pray most of all for that need of the gospel among us and in our world. Lord, you've told us how death will be conquered, how kingdoms will be subdued through the preaching of your word, that faith will come by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And Lord, if you will but speak, faith will come. If you grant power to your word, those who are deaf will hear and those who are blind will see. Light will be brought into darkness. Mercy will be found where there was none. Oh Lord, do your work. Give new hearts by the work of your spirit, that men may become holy and become fitting people to live for you. And Father, we do pray tonight, especially for those who are serving you, who are seeking to plant your 
churches, to shepherd those churches, both near and both far, those who are sent out and supported by us, and even this church, Lord. We pray that the word ministries of these churches would be faithful and fruitful, loyal to you and your scriptures. We pray, Father, as well, that those, the word that goes out would not be without deeds, but there would be those ministries that accompany the words, that display the love of Christ in this world, the lost and dying world that needs to know how he had compassion on the masses and how he spoke truth. We ask you, Lord, that those who have been raised up to preach the gospel would bring it forth with power, with authority, with faithfulness to you. We pray that they would be strengthened and enabled to continue on in the work even as they see little return. But Lord, that you would grant that return. That you would cause men to come under the conviction of their sins, to see their lost and dying condition, and to flee to the hope that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Pray that you would sustain their families in the work that they do, that you would provide them with an abundance of resources, and that among them you would raise up godly leaders around them, that there would be elders and deacons to serve alongside them, that churches could be well-established and well-ordered and faithful to you in every way. We pray, Father, that it would be your grace to connect those churches, to strengthen them by their relations to one another, just as we enjoy here. That we would realize the kingdom of God is greater than us in the midst of this body, that it has gone out and you have your people in every place. Father, pray that those people would increase, that they might be brought in and kept in and preserved in holiness, that their holiness would become greater in them, and that the number of those who are brought in who are holy would be greater than those who are in the world. We pray, Father, that you would do all these things for your name's sake, and we pray them in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's submit ourselves to the reading of God's Word once again from the Old Testament, this time from the book of Joshua, chapter 6. We'll be reading the entirety of that chapter, and let me ask you to stand again to give honor to the reading of God's word from Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priest and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the Ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take up the accursed things. Make the camp of Israel and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. 
So the people shouted when the, the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. And the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. And Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, who, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she had the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gate. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing, take your Psalter hymnals, and turn to hymn number 517. We'll remain standing to sing, I know whom I have believed, hymn 517.
Hope you have your Bible open to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to delve deep and see a picture, a model that is seen all through Scripture. We're going to see the times when God's people are to be silent and the times when God's people are to shout. In order to understand this aright and to develop a strong biblical theology of these things, we'll need the help of the Spirit. And so let's ask for that now. Our Father, we ask that you would give us by the Holy Spirit light and understanding. We confess that we are dull and distracted. Our thoughts are far away. They're on the discussion of yesterday or the plans for tomorrow unless you, by the Spirit, now arrest our minds and consciences. And so we ask that you would fix our gaze on the Scripture. Lord, we pray that you would do more than just inform us, but you would transform us by the hearing of the Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our context is in Joshua chapter 6. We're at the place in the narrative where the people of God have, have entered into the promised land. And they're now in the land circling the first city that they find, the stronghold city, the walled city of Jericho. Israel is just about to engage in their first conquest. Now, as to their specific orders, you'll remember the context at the end of chapter 5 and beginning of chapter 6. I told you that there are some places in Scripture where there are unfortunate chapter divisions, and this is one of them. If you look at the division between chapter 5 and chapter 6, it breaks up an encounter between the greater Joshua and the lesser Joshua. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to Joshua, and he comes to him with a drawn sword in his hand to give him specific orders and commands to tell him that he's going to lead the charge. And the greater Joshua, the Lord Jesus, reminds him that he'll be with him. And look what the word is that Joshua passes on. The wise man of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said in Ecclesiastes 3, 7, There is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. You all know people who have never discerned between the two of those things when it is the right time to be silent, and when it is to speak. Well, this text is going to give us profound help in understanding this. Joshua understood the principle long before Solomon recorded it. Here we are in our narrative at Jericho, and God has given orders to march around the city. Now, I want you for a moment to think about the, the scope, the volume of people who are moving, who are about to either shout or about to be silent. Hundreds of thousands of Israelite soldiers are going to encircle the city of Jericho. There are almost a million fighting men circling Jericho. These hundreds of thousands of soldiers have at the front forming the advance troop, and then they are followed by seven priests blowing seven ram's horns, followed by the ark, and then comes the rear guard of another half a million soldiers and the priests. And these, these priests were to be constantly blowing on these trumpets all the week long. All you can hear, the only sound you can hear, is just the noise of these seven trumpets going off. I don't know if it's melodic or harsh, but what we're told is they blew continually. But the soldiers were to be totally silent. Look at Joshua 6 verse 10, just for a feel of the juxtaposition. We read, Joshua commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. So get the picture. A million soldiers, totally silent, walking around the walled city of Jericho. Day after day, hour after hour, no sound comes from their lips. And this has to be one of the most ominous, chilling, eerie sights in the history of warfare. A million soldiers tramping away around. Not a word, not a shout, not a threat. The only sound you hear are those seven trumpets that just keep blaring all day long. Now why was it a time for silence for the soldiers? Why was every soldier to remain mute as he marched? And what I want to develop for you very briefly tonight is a biblical theology of silence. As we draw out concepts contained in Scripture, some of you are saying, silence, what is that? I'm not sure what that is. Carl, I have children in my house. 
But we live, even if you don't have children, we live in perhaps the most cacophonous generation ever, the noisiest time ever. And so what I say to you might come as an oddity to you. What I want to show you is that God has designed certain occasions where his people should, must be silent before him. This is counterintuitive to many of you who the radio in your car has never been off. When you start your car, the radio comes on. Or you have your lights, which is rigged at home, so that when you turn the lights on, the television comes on. You go to sleep at night to the blare of television. You wake up in the morning to the sound of a noisy alarm. There's no silence in between. You're not quite sure what to do when you're silent. But what we're going to see is God has designed all sorts of times in the Christian life when it's appropriate to be silent. Silence, by the way, is a lost discipline. It's a lost spiritual discipline in our culture. Why is it appropriate? Why does God command his people to be silent this week? And a better question, when is it appropriate to be silent before God? And I want to give you four times from this text, and then I can hint at several others, but four times when it is appropriate to be silent. And so roll up your sleeves and look with me at the word of God in Joshua 6. First of all, silence is always appropriate just before the impending judgment of God. Now, we're digging deep here to understand the broad swath of Scripture. Silence is always appropriate before the impending judgment of God. God is about to speak loudly in judgment to the Canaanites. It's fitting then for every human voice to be still. The Scriptures demand that men be silent when they stand face to face before the judgment of God. Zechariah the prophet says in Zechariah 2, to be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. This is speaking in a context where God's about to judge the enemies of Israel. But if you think back about 10 minutes ago when Pastor Anderson read you the first part of Revelation 8, we see a remarkably parallel, analogous text on this issue of silence before judgment. This is the beginning. If you just peek back to Revelation 8, this is the beginning of God's cataclysmic judgment upon his enemies. But look what happens just before those enemies. We read these words in Revelation 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Do you know what that sounds like? It sounds just like our text in Joshua 6. Seven angels, seven trumpets, sounds like seven priests with seven trumpets. And what also is analogous is how every resident in heaven is silent before the judgment of God. And think about how this jars our hearing. Silence in heaven for about half an hour. I thought heaven was that place where saints and angels spend all their time praising God loudly with a loud voice. But right then they're hushed. Why? Because if you read on in the context of Revelation 8, they're hushed because God is about to pour out his wrath on wicked men. You know this intuitively when you'll watch some courtroom drama and the guilty man is about to be seized, sentenced. A hush falls over the courtroom because this is serious business. A man's on trial for his life. He's about to be condemned. And so the judge never has to tell anyone to be quiet. He's about to pass sentence. Everyone's hanging on every word just before judgment falls. And the Israelites know this. They know as they tramp around the city, all million of them, the Israelite soldiers know that the residents of Jericho are about to be judged, and so they're silent. It's appropriate to be silent before the judgment of God. A second time when it's appropriate to be silent. It's appropriate to be silent before God intervenes in salvation. This is the inverse of what we just saw. The marching of the men around Jericho is in anticipation of promised divine intervention upon their behalf. God is about to save them, that is Israel. He's about to deliver them from their enemies. So when I use the word salvation, I'm using it in its broadest possible sense here. The silence was the prelude to the shouting, shouts of victory. Now think about an analogous text to this. I want you to do a little work with me in, the cop in your copy of God's Word. Look back at Exodus 14, and I want you to see a precursor to this. 
of when God's people are told to be silent and watch for the salvation of God. In Exodus 14, <clears throat> this is an earlier day that Joshua was there as well in the brief history of Israel as a people. This is Joshua's generation when we look at Exodus 14. And these are the fathers who are backed up against the Red Sea and hurtling down upon them at breakneck speed, chariots and horsemen, the mightiest army on the planet. The Egyptian army is headed straight into their teeth, and they, the Israelites, are unarmed. They're just a group of newly delivered slaves. What can they do? Here comes the Egyptian army, swords flashing, cavalry men shouting, the whole army of Egypt coming on top of them. And what does God say to them? Look at Exodus 14, verse 13. By the way, Joshua was there that day too. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he'll accomplish for you today. The Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Hold your peace, quite literally in Hebrew, means keep your mouth shut. Be silent. God's about to work. God's about to deliver you. He's about to save you from your enemies. And that's the same thing now that we're going to see at Jericho. God says, all you million men, be quiet. I'm about to do a mighty work. I'm going to deliver you from these mighty residents of Jericho in their huge fortified city. It's appropriate when God is about to do a work of deliverance for his people to keep your mouth closed. These fighting men, the sons of the men we read about in Exodus 14 were to march in silence around the city as they waited on God, just like their fathers waited on God against the Egyptian, to march in silence as they wait on God to work mightily in their behalf. As they tramp along, the only sound you hear is just the stepping of their sandals. They're to be fixated on each step. That's the only noise, and so they're saying, to themselves. Here's the noise going on in their mind. The battle is the Lord's. Step. He'll save us this week. Step. He'll flatten the walls of Jericho. Another step. He'll crush our enemies. Next step. This isn't the silence of melancholy. This is the silence of expectation and hope to see the Lord work to save his people. There's a third time it's appropriate to be silent before God. Silence is always appropriate before the immediate and special presence of God. Look in our narrative in Joshua 6 at verse 8. Where are these people marching in Joshua 6? Well, they're marching, and this is astounding for them. They're marching in close proximity to the ark. Half a million of them just in front of the ark, half a million of them just behind the ark. The ark, you'll remember, is the symbol of God's special and gracious and powerful and covenantal presence with them. The same ark that would stay in the Holy of Holies where only one man could go and then uh, once a year and then only for a few minutes and then only with blood. And now the ark of God, the presence of God is right there. It's, it's so close you could almost touch it. It's right in front of them or right behind them. This is the presence of God with them. One of the fitting responses when men find themselves next to God is silence. And look at the contextual flow in Joshua 6. In verse 9, right after we read about the ark, the armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark. It's just the next verse in verse 10 that silence is commanded. Silence because of reverential silence. You're right there by the ark. God is right there in their midst. And the psalmist picks up on this thing. And let me quickly make an application. There are some of you who don't know what to do in the presence of God. You know those people who they sort of have nervous laughter and nervous chatter when they're talking to people. And then when they go into their closet, they don't know how to be silent at all before the Lord. They don't know how to put their hand over their mouth and say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. They don't know how to spend 10 minutes in silence before God to adore his presence and his greatness. But listen to what the psalmist does in Psalm 62. Listen to what David writes and then answer me this question. 
can you say these words? Or when, they read, when you read them, are they foreign to you? David writes these words. Listen carefully. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. David says it again in Psalm 62. My soul waits silently for God alone. My expectation is from him. We live in a culture of noise, I said a moment ago, several years ago when I was doing student ministry and doing it very poorly. I would always say before we would leave on a mission trip or a retreat or a conference, I would print it, on huge, print it in huge letters on the retreat form, no radios, no phones. I didn't want noise because we had lots of designated time for students to be alone with God, for them to meditate on the word, for them to read scripture and to hear God speaking at them. And I had kids come to me, middle school, high school kids, and they'd say, Carl, I can't go four days without my radio. Actually, they said, I can't go four days without my Walkman, but you don't know what that means. <laughs> and I had two boys come to me and they said, Carl, if we give you 20 bucks, will you just look the other way? They tried to bribe me. I said, no, I can't be bribed. And so I made the rule that any kid who brought a radio, a phone, a, a Walkman, it became my property, and I would have the parents sign off on a form before their kid got on a bus. If I discover a Walkman or a radio or a phone, it becomes mine. Within three years of student ministry, I had a large collection of phones and Walkman pretty quickly. And I had kids, again, who just said, I can't go 24 hours without a radio. I don't know what to do when I'm silent. And, of course, they came from homes where their parents said the same thing. Jim Elliott, the great missionary martyr, wrote in his journal, I'm firmly convinced that Satan's weapon against me is constant noise. Holy silence on my part that shuts the mouth and focuses on the awesomeness of God and his presence is a lost discipline that I'm trying to recover. This happens corporately as well. Years ago, I was preached in a church, and one of the things that's so striking and disconcerting about their worship was the constant noise and moving about and their inability as a church to be silent and still and reverential at appropriate times. When they invited me back, I just declined because it was too, it was too distracting. When God is moving, when God is in our presence in worship, this is the third time, it's appropriate to be silent when he is speaking to us. A fourth time, when it's appropriate to be silent before God. Silence is appropriate before any intense battle is to be fought in the name of God. Let me say that again. Silence is appropriate before any intense battle is to be fought in the name of God. <clears throat> I'm an ex-jock, not an accomplished one, but a, a baseball, basketball player who has sat in lots of locker rooms before big games. And I want to let you in on the secret of the locker room. Do you know what's happening in the locker room before the big game? Nothing. It's shockingly quiet. And I can tell you that I've had coaches come in in basketball and baseball, and somebody might turn around and talk to another teammate, and the coach would say, get quiet. Get your mind on the big game. And so you learn quickly as an athlete. Get quiet. Get your thoughts focused. Make sure you understand the battle. Replay the game plan in your mind. Now, if that can be said of guys who are going to just play a game of basketball or baseball, how much more appropriate is it for people who are going out to fight real battles against the enemies of the Lord to be silent? Silence is appropriate before any intense battle is to be fought in the name of God. In just a few days, these, these men, these million men who are circling Jericho right now, are going to engage in intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. We'll see this over the next couple Sunday nights. Just so you'll know what they are about to face. They don't know this yet, but the walls of Jericho don't fall in on the city. They don't fall out on the Israelites. They just drop. And so here are these huge walls. They drop to the ground, and the soldiers are going to have to climb up over those walls and go into the city of Jericho for hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're going to be engaged in a fight to the death, and they know it. They will have the battle of their life on their hands. Some of them will die. What do they do? Let me be crass and use the term that you'll understand. 
It's not a biblical term. They're getting psyched during those seven days. They're getting ready for the battle. Now, at this point, you're saying, well, that's interesting. I see it. It's appropriate back when people were fighting real enemies. They ought to be quiet, and you ought to be ready, get psyched up for the big battle. But, Carl, I don't really have any battles. Oh, really? You don't? Listen to 2 Corinthians 10. Maybe this will come to a surprise to you that you have a battle every morning when you wake up. When, when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You see, my friends, you and I go into a battle every day. When we go to school, when we go to work, when you go out into the culture, you're stepping into a battle zone. The fiery darts are flying. The world, the flesh, and the devil are coming at you hard and fast. What's the best way to prepare for that? By girding up your mind. You're going into a workplace, to a schoolroom where people don't name the name of the Lord. You're going into an intense spiritual battle where temptation rages, where there are those who mock and blaspheme. What's the best way to prepare for that? By silently meditating on the promises of God. Now let me transition. We just looked at four times when it's appropriate to be silent. But I want to transition. I'd said that this text is a time for silence and a time for shouting. Look back at Joshua chapter 6. In Joshua 6, Christ, the man with the drawn sword, at the end of chapter 5 and beginning of chapter 6, has told the people to shout. Look at verse 5, to shout at a certain time. This is Christ speaking to Joshua. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And so Christ has told them this. Look at the chain of communication. Christ speaks to Joshua, the lesser Joshua. Now, do you think Joshua will be faithful to turn around and go and take that to the people and say, listen, Jesus has come to me, and here's what he said. Seven days, walk around the city, keep your mouth shut, not a word, no woofing, no sniping at the people on the walls, no talking to each other or anyone else for seven days. And then when the signal is given, when the horn blows, you shout. Or does Joshua say, you know, guys, you know, the greater Joshua, the Lord Jesus, the theophany, he told me to shout, but this is all a little bit Broadway-esque. It's a little bit staged. I'm just going to tell all of you guys to march around. There's no need to shout. You know what Joshua does? He does what we've come to expect from him already in Scripture. He obeys, he salutes the greater Joshua. Look at verse 10 very carefully. At the close of verse 10, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. He turns around now to the people and faithfully passes on the order that the greater Joshua gave him. Then on verse 16 and verse 20 in chapter 6, notice on the seventh day, Joshua orders them, they shout. Why did they shout? Now notice what just happened. We just transitioned. We just looked at four times and reasons to be silent. Now we're going to talk about times to shout. We've moved from the silence of the seven days to the one mighty shout. Here's a million soldiers who on cue let up a roar of a shout. Sounds like a thunderclap. Why did they shout? I'll give you four reasons why. Why they shouted. The first answer is the wrong answer. And you see this answer given by many critics of Scripture. Rudolf Bultmann was the liberal, unbelieving scholar of the early 20th century. And he applied what he called demythologizing to the Scripture. And so Bultmann and many of his fellow scholars in Germany said, you know what brought the walls down at Jericho? Notice, by the way, the absence of any supernatural belief here. Do you know what brought the walls down of Jericho? What brought the walls down of Jericho was the accumulated decibel force of the people's shout. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means the shout was so loud it just knocked the walls down. Boltman said, and actually wrote this in print, wasn't embarrassed to do so, Boltman says, it's just like an opera star 
when she hits a high note, it will shatter a glass. And so what happened here, when the million men under Joshua shouted, it just shattered the walls and brought them down. It's just the accumulated decibel force, Boltman said. This, of course, is utter demonic nonsense. The word of God doesn't say the wall fell because a verbal sonic boom happened. Others say, well, you know, the, the region of Jericho is prone to tremors. And one just happened on the seventh day that Israel marched around the walls, and so a tremor occurred. The first answer, why did they shout? Well, to make their accumulated decibel force knock the wall down. That's a wrong answer. That's a naturalistic answer. Wrong answer. The second reason, why did they shout? This is going to come as a shock to some of you who have put this aspect of the Christian life off your radar screen. They shouted in simple obedience to the commands of God. They've been told by Christ, the greater Joshua, and by Joshua, the lesser, their ruler, to shout. For them to refuse to shout when commanded would have been clear disobedience. But there's a class of evangelicals now who never learn this. They say, you know, obedience in the Christian life is optional. I don't like it. It forces me to bend my will to somebody else. It tells me what to do with my time and my money and my words and my relationships. I don't like obedience, so I'm not going to obey. Ignoring what Jesus said when he said, if you love me, if, it's a conditional word, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. These million men shout in simple obedience to plain divine commands. It's a very simple answer. Why did they shout? Because God commanded them. When was the last time you did something simply in the Christian life because God commands it? When was the last time you thought God has mandated, I must obey him? When was the last time you bent your will towards the commands of God simply out of love for Christ? A third reason why they shouted. They shouted, and this is what I really want us to focus on because now we're coming to the essence and the core of Joshua 6. And the shout and what really happened that day at Jericho. They shouted because of faith in God and in his promises. They shouted because they believed God in his word. Jehovah had given his promise to them. Christ had promised in verse 5, it shall come to pass. This is Christ speaking. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn and you hear the sound of the trumpet and all the men shout, all millions strong with a great shout, then the walls of the city will fall down. Christ had given them a promise that the walls would fall down after the shout. They believed the promise. They were confident that God would not bail on his word. And we don't have to speculate whether they believed God's promise and had faith because here are the glorious words we read of them in Hebrews 11.30 in the Hall of Faith. By faith, listen to this carefully, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. Hebrews 11.30 doesn't say, by tremors and decibels, the wall fell down. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. These people believed God's promise that he would bring the wall down, and they acted, and they had to shout before the walls would fall. And look at the sequence. Look at verse 5 of chapter 6 very carefully. Jesus, speaking to Joshua, says, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, First comes the priest blowing the trumpet. When you hear the sound of the trumpet on that seventh day and all the people shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat. It's sequential. First you've got to blow the trumpet. Then you've got to shout. Then the walls will fall down. Answer me. What would have been the status of those walls if they wouldn't have shouted? What if they just said, you know, we're going to look like idiots here. You know these guys are going to blow their horns, and then all million of us are shouting. What if we're shouting and nothing happens, and the walls are still standing? These people will be laughing at us from the top of the walls. They'll be mocking us, saying, oh, what was that for? That's not what happens at all. These men, a million believers. For those of you who, to use the language of John Calvin, who said, who you want to consign our Old Testament fathers to a herd of swine. And don't understand, these are our fathers in the faith. These are the, the, the most glorious word that can be said of them. These are believers. 
They believed the promises of God. They believed that when the trumpet sounded and they shouted, they believed the walls would drop like a shot. Hebrews 11 tells us so. And that's what faith is. Faith is believing God and acting upon his word. Now let me just throw in a parenthesis very quick. <coughs> I just said the definition of faith. Faith is believing God and acting upon his word. Faith is not acting on a hunch or a feeling or your own speculation. Faith is acting on the word of God. They had a word to act on. God had given them the word in verse 5. If you shout, the wall will fall down. They had that promise. It's been just a few weeks ago that I was having a conversation with a friend here in town, thankfully a friend who doesn't attend Woodruff Road, who said, Carl, I'm believing God for a raise. I'm trusting that God will give me a raise. And I thought, as we walk through our neighborhood, do I really want to have this theological conversation with this person? Or do I just want to leave and say, oh, look, we're passing by my corner. I'm just going to go on home now. I thought, no, I'll, I'll have this conversation. So I said, has God promised you in his word that you're going to get a raise? No, but I'm just believing him for it. I said, that's not faith. That's speculation. You just made something up to believe him. And you see this with the faith movement. You need to believe God for that BMW. Well, has God ever promised in his word to give you a BMW? No, I've looked in the concordance. There is no BMW in the concordance whatsoever. So when somebody says, I'm believing God, I'm walking in faith, God's going to do this or that, they've made something up to believe in. That's not Christian faith. Faith is taking God's word of promise. <clears throat> this is saying, I believe what God has revealed, and I'm going to live by it. And that's what these men shouted, these million men. They didn't make something up and shout. They said, God has promised us through his mouthpiece, if we'll shout, the walls will come down. That's faith. Faith is acting in response to the word of God. That's biblical faith, not self-delusion. Faith is believing and acting upon a divinely given promise. Has God given you promises to believe? Here's one. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. When you believe that and act upon it, you're not believing in something that you've made up. You're simply obeying God's word and his command. And so these men, they shout with a shout of triumph before the walls fell. That's faith. Did you hear that? They shouted a shout of triumph before the walls fell. Soldiers usually shout exuberantly and joyously only after victory, not these. They shouted because they believed God's word. They shouted because they believed victory was sure. Now let me make a couple of applications to us as a body. First of all, biblical religion, biblical saving faith at its core is confident belief in God's supernatural power. Now let me say that again because that needs to, to get deep down in our bones. Biblical religion, biblical saving faith at its core is a confident belief in God's supernatural power. So saving faith is not possessed when you're always trying to find a natural explanation for God's mighty deeds in history. If that's the case, you no longer have biblical religion or biblical faith. The moment we deny God's supernatural, miraculous intervention, as it's recorded in biblical history, like in this chapter, we're dead in the water. Biblical faith believes that God flattened Jericho. Biblical faith believes that God spoke in six consecutive 24-hour days and all the galaxies and solar systems and worlds leaped into existence. Biblical faith believes that God parted the Red Sea. Biblical faith believes that God sent down manna from heaven for 40 years. Biblical faith believes that God held back the Jordan while Israel crossed on dry land. And most of all, most of all, biblical faith believes that God raised Jesus from the dead. This is fundamental to being a Bible Christian. This is strong persuasion of God's supernatural power exercised on behalf of his learning, of his people. And let me say, if you're hearing and right now you're saying, well, Carl, you know, I like a lot of things about church. I like getting dressed up. When else would I wear my nice clothes if I didn't come to church? I like the hymns. I like the stories. 
I like the class of people I meet. Well, most of them at Woodruff Road. But I like these sort of things. But you know, Carl, I just have one problem with thinking. Come on now, Carl. Really? A man came out of a grave on the third day? Come on, I've been at too many gravesides. That God held up a sea for hours while millions of his people passed through on dry land? Come on, we live in a scientific age. Carl, I like all that other stuff. I'll sing the hymns. But don't tell me to believe something that just goes completely counter to reason. Then, my friend, you're not in possession of biblical saving faith. Biblical saving faith believes in the supernatural power of God. Is that you? Do you delight in the power of God? Do you boast in it? Do you turn around and say to folks, hey, look at Joshua 6. Look at what my God can do. He can drop the 40-foot walls of a city in three seconds. Look at what my God can do. He can raise the dead. Or do you say, "Mm, my God, I'd rather not talk about it. I'm kind of embarrassed. No, saving faith believes in the supernatural and boasts in it. A second application. We must learn from this text to never despise feeble means when they're appointed by God. Think about these soldiers. We don't see any of them recorded saying, come on, Joshua, shout. What good is that going to do? You know, we, well, over here, Joshua, we have a company in the military who are sound engineers, and we know that it's not going to do any good. We can all point our voices at the wall at the exact same time, all million of us, and even the reverberations aren't going to knock a wall down. If you really want to do something good, Joshua, let's build a battering ram. Let's knock this thing down. We've been marching around here for seven days. If we'd been building battering rams, we'd already be inside the city. How do you expect shouting to bring (coughs) the walls down? The question we must learn to ask is this. (coughs) Has God appointed a means in our situation? If so, then we must use it no matter how ineffectual it seems. For example, God has commanded us to do something that seems incredibly weak ineffectual and foolish to the world's eyes and that is the preaching of the word the culture even much of the evangelical culture says we've got to come up with better means and so we've got to use video clips and liturgical dance and drama and all these other things because preaching you know it just doesn't communicate to 21st century moderns Carl you got to contextualize do you know what Paul said of preaching as the means He said the preaching of the gospel would be foolishness to those who are perishing, but to others God would use it for their salvation. And we need to learn if God has appointed a means, no matter how foolish and ineffectual it seems, we must use it. Does a shout seem like it will be ineffectual against stone walls soaring up to the clouds? No, because that's the means God has appointed, and he used it. Remember, God's word and power are behind and undergirding the feeblest means. And so don't say, whether it's the preaching of the word or whatever, don't say, what good will it do? Rather say, Lord, will you use and prosper this means that you've appointed? Oh, may the Lord make us a faith-filled, means-using body for his own glory. Let's pray. Our God, how we thank you for your sovereign and supernatural power. And indeed, your power is all our boast. Your power has parted seas, flattened walls, and raised men from the dead. Oh, Lord, we trust in that power. And Lord, we pray that you would give us strong faith to believe, that you would even give us saving faith, that we would put aside all our doubts and skepticism. You'd give us an obedient faith, that we would walk in the promises that you've given, and we would obey your commands. And so, Lord, we plead, help us now as our fathers in the faith have done that we've just read in this text. Help us to walk by faith and see your blessing and even your triumph. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take your Trinity Psalter hymnal now and turn to hymn 171 as we stand and sing, O Word of God incarnate, hymn 171.
receive the Lord's blessing, his benediction. Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Amen.